Welcome to Reframed, a podcast created to educate, encourage, and inspire parents and professionals. The research is clear. Parenting a child that has a history of loss, abuse, neglect, or trauma requires parenting skills and insight to be reframed. We partner with child welfare experts to bring you evidence-based and research-driven information. Reframed host, Emily Moorhead, LPC, and guests strive to make an impact on our world by creating conversations about topics that are important to you, your family, and our communities. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Reframed. Today, I'm joined with Jorge Gama, and he's going to be talking with us today about secondary trauma. Jorge, will you tell me about yourself? Yes, yeah, so I am the clinical director for the Restore Advanced Outpatient Program uh, at Mending Clinic in Arlington, Texas. Um, and I'm an LPCS, which is an LPC supervisor. So I supervise interns that are trying to get their full license. Um, part of my background when I first came into the industry was working with chronically suicidal and homicidal clients and helping them um, not complete suicide or homicide. And then from there, I moved on to working with an outpatient um, program at a hospital and started it from the ground up, working with clients that were struggling with chronic depression, chronic anxiety, substance abuse. Um, and then from there, I moved into a private practice um, where I'm at now. And I've been here, gosh, almost 10, nine years now in private practice. And um, we do individual counseling and we have an outpatient program as well. That's awesome. Jorge, your experience in the field is nothing light about it. You've got some heavy work with some high-risk clients. So your passion topic is secondary trauma. I'm assuming that's kind of how you walked into it. Yes. You know, I think um, I had a professor one time that said, you're going to get the clients that you need, not the ones that you want. And while I was in school, I'm like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And then once I got into the field, I was like, oh my gosh, she was so wise. So yes, now looking back, I have gotten the clients that I need, not necessarily the ones that I wanted. And it's been growing ever since. That's wonderful. I mean, you're doing really difficult work and secondary trauma is a term that we hear in the mental health community, but sometimes we don't know how to define it. So could you define it for me? Yes. So secondary trauma is, it's like PTSD-like symptoms. And so post-traumatic stress disorder is when somebody is involved in a life-threatening situation where basically it reframes the way they look at their life. And so if um, somebody is sexually abused or somebody is robbed or somebody is assaulted, you know, now they look at their life or they look at the world like it, maybe it's not safe or, you know, or maybe I can't trust people or I can't get close. So the people that are working with that population are hearing the stories in detail, are witnessing the clients shake, have flashbacks, um, get emotionally flooded in that moment. Um, and if they're not directly working with them, then they could be reading the case files and going through and trying to figure out what happened when. And so as you're reading that, that gets imprinted in your brain and everything starts. Um, the, the, what, the example that I like to use is our brain is like a cell phone. And so on a cell phone, once your memory starts getting full, if you don't go in and clear it out, then you start, uh, your apps don't play like they used to. Um, you start missing phone calls, the internet is slower. You start having problems with the connectivity of the phone. And that's what happens with secondary trauma is we get full because we're reading the things um, either in the case file or we're talking to clients and we're actually hearing them. And so we're processing that and bringing that in. Even though we weren't there, our imagination does kick in and we start thinking about how it happened and when it happened. And sometimes you get so many details that you can pretty much play it in your head. And that's where secondary trauma comes from. I've definitely heard this in the adoption community, specifically with our families who are adopting a child from a hard place, right? They're adopting a child who has a history. Um, they're reviewing the file. Our, our GLADNI team is reviewing the file and they're reading some really hard things. Um, but I think sometimes it just feels like oh, this is hard, but I'm okay. And you even refer to secondary trauma as silent. So tell me how that term came to mind when, when talking about secondary trauma. Well, secondary trauma doesn't happen until it happens. 
Mm -hmm. right so there typically isn't like a line of demarcation where you say okay so i had this event and now i have secondary trauma it typically happens like a gut punch and then from there you just feel exhausted and you feel like just not the same and so when you look at post-traumatic stress disorder there's a line of demarcation there's an event that happens or there's a series of events that happen and i think oftentimes what we forget um, specifically with secondary trauma is that you know we can unsee what we've seen we can't unhear what we've heard and so when we're reading these there's a level of protection that we're trying to provide or there's a level that we can do something about this so we get passionate about it but that starts building up and that's where you start seeing um, once the symptoms typically um, happen before but we don't see them as such until we had that that incident where we feel like okay th this I'm, I'm traumatized now so even you know in our society right now there's a lot of hard things going on um, and a lot of information on our news feeds and um, on our TV is secondary possible secondary trauma possible in a situation like that Yes, because if you think about what we're seeing in our social media or in the news, everything creates a level of hypoarousal, right? It creates or hyperarousal. It creates um, our heart rate to start beating faster. It creates tension. One of the things that I like to do with my clients is I'll say, okay, so go ahead and scan your body right now. Tell me what you're feeling. And, you know, they kind of look at me and they're like, okay. And, and they just sit there. And I'll say, okay, and they're like, well, I don't feel anything. And I'm like, no, no, let's go ahead and stay with it. Because typically what you see is once they sit there in the moment for some time, they start feeling tension, whether it's in their neck or in their chest or in their stomach or in their legs. And once you start really connecting that tension with what's going on in their life, you start seeing what's playing in the background, like that app on a phone that's still open, that's playing in the background, that's affecting them in that moment. That's such a beautiful analogy for it. It's kind of hanging out in our subconscious, but it's affecting us every single day and in, in most of our moments. So how would we distinguish between secondary trauma and what I hear co commonly in the community as burnout? What are the differentiations? Yeah, so secondary trauma is looking at a situation where you are reading somebody else's traumatic events you have detailed information about those traumatic events. When you look at burnout, we're really looking at, it's typically work-related. So whether it's too many hours or whether it's looking at um, not having the support that you need or not having um, the ability to move away from work. So it's like an overwhelming amount of responsibility, but it's for an institution, not necessarily for a person. And so secondary trauma, there's some kind of connection that we have to the file that we're reading or to the person that we're working with. So there's a heart to heart connection there. With burnout, it's typically with an institution, a situation that you cannot control. And that brings you out. The other thing is that with burnout, if you change jobs, typically the burnout will decrease. With secondary trauma, if you change jobs, the trauma will follow you. So I'm thinking about, you know, specifically, you know, someone who's working at an institution whose job is to read those files, right, and to advocate for those hard stories, um, and they're, they're inside that institution feeling burnout. So would that maybe even heighten them at risk for burnout? Yes, yes. And the hierarchy that I believe I have seen is the burnout symptoms happen before secondary trauma. Um, so I'm, you know, correlation is not causation. And so, I, but it's definitely, it feeds it and they're interchangeable in a lot of ways, but they're not the same. That makes sense. So how do we distinguish um, between, you know, how to apply treatment to these people who have experienced secondary trauma, burnout, PTSD. How do we care for them? And even as employers or someone who's supporting a parent, how do we pour into them? Yeah. So somebody that um, has post-traumatic stress disorder. So let's go kind of back to that definition, right? Yeah. Somebody that has PTSD, 
has struggled an event, something that has caused them to look at their life as unsafe, to look at their situation as they have to protect themselves. Um, vulnerability is something that is very, very scary. And so when we're treating somebody that has PTSD, we have to help them heal. Now, healing doesn't always mean that they have to go and retell their story um, every single time. Because sometimes what happens is that re-traumatizes them. So if you think about when a child has been um, sexually abused um, and they go and they start talking to the detectives and the police officers, um, they're doing their job. They have to, and, and CPS, they're doing their job. They have to do, they have to get the facts. But in that process, they're telling their story over and over and over and over. And so what happens there is it ends up re-traumatizing. So with a lot of the clients that I work with that have PTSD, it's a matter of being there with them and just connecting with them and being their guide because it's their story. And so I think, um, I, I always like to think as clinicians or like CASA workers or you guys at Gladney, you know, we are, the responsibility of healers is put upon us, not just a clinician, not just, you know, a cluster of symptoms that we're treating, but we're helping heal. And so if you can reconstruct that and, and think about walking with them and this is their story and they're going to heal at their pace, that's what we look at with PTSD. Now, when we look at secondary trauma, we're looking at creating a level of support. We're looking at creating, now PTSD level of support as well. Um, but secondary trauma is support, it's education. It's helping them understand the difference because part of what happens with secondary trauma is if you feel under um, educated or you feel underprepared, or you feel like you don't have somebody to talk to and process some of the cases going on, then that begins to build up. So the difference in those two, again, with PTSD is walking through the process with them as a guide and let them heal um, at their pace with secondary trauma. It's helping them process and feel supported and understand that they're not alone, but at the same time, it's creating them to be better prepared. And what the research says, is that with PTSD, the more that you report it, um, that you talk about it, and each person processes differently. But again, you can be re-traumatized. With secondary trauma, the more that you talk about it and the more you feel supported, the healthier you feel and the better that you can have catharsis from that stress. That's really important, I think, because I'm hearing so much prevention in what you just said. So bringing awareness, you know, when I'm looking at the lens um, through adoptive parents, right, bringing awareness to them that this may occur for you and here's how to take care of you before it happens, where they're not to the point of, you know, mental exhaustion, but they can have education that feels empowering and feel safe in that. Um, I'm wondering, you know, adoptive parents that we work with all the time balance, um, you know, how they share their story with, about their child, um, who they can share it with, who they can trust. Um, and even adoptees as they're kind of processing their own story, who they can feel safe with and trust with. And so I'm wondering if someone has a hard story, um, and you're hearing that and you're holding that for them as a parent, um, or a friend of an adoptee or a birth parent, how do you hold that or how do you trust someone to hold that for you? So I'm thinking you don't want to over reveal your child's story, but you also need support is what I'm hearing you say. Yes. So there's different groups that you can look for um, that can provide that same support. It's people that have either gone through the same process or people that are going through the same process that understand the, the intricacies, the difficulties, the really minute things that other people wouldn't understand or, or catch right through this process. And so I think, you know, people always, um, I think they give us we have to trust our gut. And so when we're talking to somebody, it's really, really important that we kind of sit back and we go, okay, so how did I feel about talking to that person? When I walked away, did I feel some relief or did I feel overwhelmed or did I feel you know, even guilty or shameful for talking about that and really trusting your gut? Um, and it might be where you know the person is a, a relative or it could even be a spouse. 
And it's okay to say, hey, you know, when you do that, like it really does not help me. Like, here's what I need from you. You know, I think being clear and communicating is being kind. In that moment, it may not feel like it, but if you say, look, this is what I need from you, I think that that creates kind of that expectation of what you're looking for. But, you know, for the parents, for the parents, what I would recommend is to really watch their language with the kid um, because sometimes they're trying to do things that are really trying to connect with them, um, but they're actually pushing them away. And so when we look at um, kids that have been adopted or kids that have been in the foster system or difficult kids, if there's a history of abuse, then with them growing up, the person that abusing them at some point they trusted or that abuser specifically used those words, you can trust me. And so when a parent says, hey, you can trust me, I'm here for you, that could actually be triggering for the child. And so what I would recommend parents to do is to ask them, what can I do to help you feel safe? So if we look at you know hierarchy of needs, the kids that are coming out from a tough situation first need to know that you are gonna provide a safe environment. And that's not really the hard part. The hard part is then taking the steps to provide that safe environment and following through with the things that you either agree to or that the child is telling you, this is what I need to be safe. So how do parents manage, you know, if they have a child in their home that is processing, you know, a PTSD episode or is, you know, is struggling with that, or, you know, if there's someone that you love that's going through that, how do you listen without prying? Because you obviously don't want to re-traumatize that person. So it's putting it back in their core. So we know um, motivational interviewing, and it's really telling them, hey, you know, I'm noticing that you're either shutting down or I'm noticing that you look upset. Um, and it's letting them know, hey, if you need anything, I'm here to talk. That way it, op- it leaves the door open. And that's something that I think is so important. Um, as parents, we have to leave the door open for our kids to walk through that door. If we try to force them through it, they're gonna come through kicking and screaming. And that's gonna be the same thing with their trauma stories. I had a family that I was working with and um, the child, uh, which was now an adult, had actually had, uh, had been raped. And from that, after that incident, it was a completely different child, had several suicide attempts that had happened. Um, and it got to the point where one of the parents was actually sleeping on the door frame um, every night to make sure that the child was safe. Um, and by the time that we saw them, that child was now 22 years old. And this happened when the child was 16. So for six years prior, the parent had been there and had been anywhere the child would go, the parent was just following them around, calling them, you know, texting them, wanting to know where they're at. And so what's happening there is the child is pushing the parent away and saying, hey, you're not safe. You're just not safe. And so helping the parent understand that their identity is not designed just around being a parent. Um, And it's difficult to separate that. But when you have a parent that is able to differentiate between their kid and themselves. And that gives them that space to have the emotional energy and to have the objectivity to how best and best in their kids help. I love that because I'm hearing you say that you kind of have to check yourself at the door, right? That being a parent and taking care of someone who has a hard history is also tuning into yourself um, and listening you know, to what you need and what your child needs and not projecting that. Um, which is difficult, especially when it gets blurry, you know, with, with some of these things like secondary drama and trauma and PTSD. How do parents check themselves? What would you recommend? There's two things that I would really encourage them to look at. And if, if, um, if we're looking at somebody that has some trauma and they're taking it on their own, there's, there's two things. So there's like interpersonal and intrapersonal right? And intrapersonal is, okay, what's going on with me? So you really looking at yourself and saying, okay, why does this bother me? And number two is an interpersonal. So it's looking at the parent and the child and saying, okay, is there discord? 
And typically what we see is that with the parent and the child, there isn't a discord. So it's just intrapersonal, which is the parent themselves are saying, I failed or I wasn't there or I didn't do enough. And so they're believing this lie as truth. And for parents, I have them look at the facts and say, okay, at what point was there a shift? At what point was there change? And so typically, if there was an event, then they say, well, I should have, could have, would. And helping understand, helping parents understand that they, best, they did the best that they could with what they had in that moment. And I always tell them, look, I know that you did the best that you could with what you had. And if you would have had different, I know you would have done different because you're here today in my office. So that's telling me that you're wanting to do different. And so reflecting that back to them helps them understand, okay, so I am trying to do different and I did do the best that I could with what I had. But it's really taking and saying, um, I had a, one of my therapist friends one time said, hey, you know, when I talk to parents and they're having uh, maybe a difficult relationship, you ask them, you know, do you, where do you see yourself when your child is getting married? Do you see yourself there next to them and being them through that ceremony or do you not? And what it, what it does is it helps put their situation in a bigger perspective. Because when we look at it myopically, it's like this. And if I have my hand like this, I can see my keyboard, but I can't see the computer. I can't see the mic. I can't see the wall. But if I step back a little bit, I can see a little bit more of the computer. I can see the mic fully. I can see behind me. But if I can take it down, create some space and help the parents understand that, hey, we're playing the long ball here. We're not just playing a sprint. That helps them take a step back and make better decisions today to help benefit their relationship in the future. I even hear that in, you know, looking at how they take care of themselves because it is the long haul. Um, and if you're sprinting in the marathon at the beginning, it's going to be a long marathon. Um, and so just kind of being prepared and using that lens, I think it's really helpful. Jorge, thank you so much for your time today and your wisdom on this really heavy topic. You've walked the walk and, and I appreciate that you're leading, you know, people in the right direction to pour into themselves and take care of themselves and be aware of maybe some of the, you know, the needs that they may be having after this podcast. If someone's interested in staying connected with you, can you share with us how? Yeah, they can call our office at 682-730-6363. And the 6363 is for MEND, M-E-N-D. Or they can get our website at www.mendingclinic.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jorge. I appreciate your time. I am doing a special sign-off today. As I've shared with viewers, I have two precious little ones in my home and I've decided to take a step back from the Reframe podcast so I can continue to pour into them and enjoy connecting with their precious little lives while they're still little. I appreciate all of my time on the Reframe podcast and I'm so grateful for all of the opportunities for conversation and connection that I've been able to have. I want to say a special thank you to Jennifer Lanter, Nancy Robbins, and Jess Alvarez for making this dream come true. It's been a fabulous team, and I'm looking forward to many more podcasts in the listener seat. You may see me back as a guest one day, but I know that we will continue to reframe a lot of perspectives for you, our viewers. Check us out for season three. We look forward to having you back. Thanks for listening to Reframed. Visit GladneyUniversity.org to access the show notes and learn about upcoming trainings at Gladney University. We'd love your feedback, so please rate, review, and subscribe. Until next time.